Aloha. Welcome back. Um, thank you so much for watching our episode. I'd like to just invite our expert panelists. So we have Chris Warren, who you met in the first segment, Hannah Mounts in the second segment, Taya Penniman, who started off our third segment, Laura Berthold, Chris Farmer, and Floyd Reed. I think Floyd's with us. Um, actually, I didn't see him join in, but um, if he's here, he will answer questions. Um, behind the scenes, we had some folks, Peter Lescom, Fern Duval, um, whose phone video messages we were putting at the end, but those um, aren't in the video yet. Uh, Dan Dennison, Brian Berkowitz, Nathan Eagle, also helping to film as well as Thor Serafin, who's our primary editor for most of our episodes. So with that, I will stop talking and try to moderate your, your questions as I see people are, are still taking the poll. So our first question for the panelists is how quickly could the mosquito suppression be implemented in the habitats that are targeted? Maybe Taya, if you're back with us, can give us an idea about that? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that question? Sure, we hear you. Um, and so the question is how quickly could the mosquito suppression be implemented in the habitats targeted? Yeah, we're hoping, uh, assuming that if we get through all of our permitting requirements and community engagement process, it, um, it wouldn't be f until at least another couple of years. So I would say first release on the landscape would be in 2022, 2023 is what we're hoping for. So that's quite a ways down the line. Um, in terms of Hannah's extinction prediction and how long we have to help the QEQ. Yes, it is long. Um, and, and, but it's also the, the work that we're doing, it's on a scale that we've really hasn't been tried before. This is a really exciting technology. It's been used for, for public health purposes, but mostly in the kinds of, in urban environments. And you can see like if the, um, the images that we saw in the video, this is complicated habitat. So it's innovative, it's exciting, and it's challenging. And, and we wanna be sure we get it right. Even though everyone involved in this project really feels the urgency, we also, it would, could also be disaster if we go out and try to do this and we don't do it right, we don't have enough information, and then we fail and people, the public says, you tried, it didn't work, and, and we don't have the long-term support. Another really important thing for people to understand is it's not a quick process. It's going to take a number of years. And because the process isn't um, self-sustaining, you have to keep releasing the mosquitoes. It's a long-term effort. And it needs to be. Well, Taya's <laughs> video is freezing up on us. We we have another question. Um, it's about our local ranchers helping with efforts. It seems open watering might be a breeding ground and that's actually one of the things that we didn't um, fit into the episode. So I've seen photos of where the pigs wallowing and making muddy areas that are mosquito breeding grounds. I, I saw some photos that Chris Warren had taken of mosquito breeding areas in Nakula. So can somebody from the Forest Bird Project speak to that? Um, I'll just say really quick, I think that the, all, all of the private ranches and other agencies that we have dealt with have, uh, have been very supportive. Like you would picture for, um, you know, giving to cows or such is really making up a huge chunk of the larval habitat. Quite a bit, bit of habitat exists out there just in the form of little pockets in the lava rock um, that fill pretty quickly and they warm up very quickly and provide pretty good habitat but I'm sure if we if we asked them to we could easily get good buy-in from private landowners um, to reduce you know mosquito larval habitat from that perspective.
I can go on about larval habitat all day if we want to talk about that. I mean, it is, it is a, it's a problematic facet of this whole story and then we know very little about mosquitoes and how they move around and what is the important breeding habitat and what conditions um, do they do best in, what conditions obviously we want to know do they do worst in. Um, breeding, the important breeding habitat might actually vary depending on the habitat, the island, all sorts of things. Um, I think it's, a, it's, another, it's another thing that uh, supports the idea of going after the adult phase. Um, because knowing and seeking out and treating all of the available larval habitat might be a lot more difficult than something like the Wolbachia treatment that was described. If I could add in, that's one real advantage of the Wolbachia approach that we're pursuing is that you don't have to find every one of the larval habitats, which is you find some of them, but it's almost impossible to find all of them because any little puddle will do. So by having the male mosquitoes that you release be what you're, uh, you're um, using to cause the population to crash, they find the females for you. You don't have to do it. It's the male's biology that's driving the system. So it's much more effective than having humans go out and trying to find the larval habitat. So. So uh, I have a question. So I don't, I don't know if this is possible. Like, so like in the lab, like, is it possible to like, cause uh, I don't know much about muscular biology, but is it possible like to release the bacteria into the water and have them naturally f find the larva? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't, does, does that make sense? It makes sense. I was waiting to hear if Floyd was on the line. Do you know? I don't think he registered and said he was going to be here, but I don't see him turning in. So perhaps he had a connection issue like I know some other folks did. Um, Chris, if you want to take that or if Taya can help. Sure, I can take it. No, Nathan, that's a really good question. Um, the bacteria can't survive free living. It has to be inside the actual cells of the mosquito. And one of the hardest things is they get these long micro pipettes that they actually insert the bacteria into the eggs. And so they have to breathe the bacteria in a lab. And that's what Floyd Reed was showing you at his lab is he's doing that. And it's easy to describe, but it's incredibly difficult to have that and be successful. So if you just release the bacteria, they wouldn't be uptaken by the mosquitoes. And the Wolbachia bacteria, there's a lot of different strains. If you think about um, you know, colds and viruses and how many different types there are, there's a lot of different types of Wolbachia. Uh, estimates are about 60% of all insects have it in them. So you have to make sure that it is a different strain that's out there in the wild. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it gets really quickly into cellular biology. And uh, it's probably as much as I should say, because I'm a bird nerd. I do all the, the forest bird stuff. Okay. Thank you. I believe we had another question up in the chat, um, and it's about the dangers of spreading antibiotic resistance with the tetracycline used on the larvae. So again, Chris or Taya, I, I will say that as a fisheries biologist, we use tetracycline as a marker in larval fish, in adult fish. It, it, it helps form one of the vertebral rings, and so you can use it as an agent growth measure. It was also commonly given to people for um, acne back in the day. Um, so it, but in terms of antibiotic resistance, um, I, I don't know for certain. So maybe Chris or uh, Taya has some insight into that. I can, yeah, I can try that one. The, the, the tetracycline that's only used in the lab to clear the, the background, Wolbachia strain that's there, and, or, and, then, and then the new one is injected. So um, I, I don't think you're, I don't think there's really any danger of spreading any kind of antibiotic resistance to that. And you also made a comment in the chat there, Taya, about the bacteria being passed maternally only by the females. 
Um, and we have another question about how close we are to having mosquitoes that would be able to reproduce. Um, ooh, some really technical questions about how many mosquitoes would also be needed to drive the populations down. Uh, and maybe the frequency. So the question is about also about would they need to be released annually? Is that often enough, Taya, or more frequent? Yeah, those are great questions. And and one of the things about this project that's awesome is that because this technology is being used for human health purposes, we're really able to take advantage of existing knowledge that's out there. And one of the kind of the rule of thumb is that what you want to do is release a ratio of 10 Wolbachia males to every one Wolbachia male that's out there in the wild. And so then you need to know, well, how many are out there and, and also where, where, to breed, where to release them because you want to do it where the males are. Um, we're talking millions of mosquitoes, basically, um, that would be released. And the, and the general strategy that's been done elsewhere is uh, on a weekly basis, but we're still figuring that out. But but that's the way it's been done elsewhere. And then and then over time, you will see a suppression of the population. And so presumably, then your the numbers that you'd be releasing would go down. But it really depends upon the the density, the abundance of the mosquitoes in the area that you're trying to target. Our next question is about getting people educated and involved, um, Hawaiian focused groups. Um, and I'll let Laura take the question as she's already starting to write back, but groups like Kupu um, or the Pipes, which is the UH Hilo intern program, um, other internship programs or teacher professional development opportunities that might be available. Hi, yes, I did answer it. We do host uh, interns and participants from Kupu and from UH Pipes. Um, we actually just had our intern from the Pipes program go back to UH Hilo uh, for the interesting school year. Um, and so, yeah, there's actually some great Kupu positions uh, available right now that I encourage people to apply for. Um, you can find that on their website. and. Um, yeah, there are some opportunities for educating teachers. Um, the East Maui Watershed Partnership has a really good program where uh, they do sort of like a watershed demonstration and there's, you know, during non-COVID times, they take students out into uh, the Nature Conservancy's Waikamai Preserve um, to see the native forest and the native habitat or the, the native birds there. Um, and let's see, by educating teachers, Maui Mauka Conservation Awareness is also another program that we do. It's um, a three-hour workshop, for, mostly geared towards tour guides, so that they can, um, you know, implement some of this na native species knowledge on their tours and also be aware of invasive species. But we've also invited uh, teachers and students to um, to the workshop as well. So uh, we just hosted one in April on Zoom, and hopefully we can host another one. Uh, later in the fall. Thanks, Brian, for um, copying that that website there. Um, there's also the um, environmental Hawaii Environmental Education um, Group too. Um, I can copy that uh, link in the in the chat too. In the URL for our. I'll paste it again, but it's basically the episode's homepage on our Voice of the Sea page, and we'll try to put in as many links to information as we can. But one of the curriculum resources that we have up there is the Symphony of the Hawaiian Birds, and so there's a lot of great teacher resources in terms of, uh, I think there's 16 different lessons to do in your classroom about Hawaiian bird or Hawaiian forest birds, and then the Maui Forestburg website itself is pretty great and you can go and see about the different birds. You can click on the button to hear their audio calls. Um, but I don't know about more professional development opportunities that are accredited by where teachers would get, um, you know, units or, or PDE3 credits that they might need for relicensure. There was a question about avian pox, and I think that's a, 
that's a good question. I mean, a lot of times we just wrap up malaria and pox in avian diseases or mosquito-borne diseases. Um, like we discussed, malaria is primarily or maybe wholly spread by Culex quincafasciatus, but there are other species of mosquito um, that spread pox. Um, for honey creepers, fortunately or unfortunately, our, it seems to be more of a maiming disease. Some species tend to, they, they, a major symptom is facial swellings for pox, and we don't see that very often in honey creepers. In some of the areas that we have um, collected blood samples or banded birds from at lower elevations where they experience more pox, you see more and more missing toes and uh, um, that certainly could have, uh, an effect overall, but it's not as immediate a threat as malaria. Having said that, I think once we, when we tackle avian malaria at higher elevations and birds start to move downhill where there's higher densities of some of the other mosquito species, particularly Aedes albopictus and some of the other Aedes species, we would probably see a whole lot more pox. Um, but we don't see a lot of pox at higher elevation now. That certainly could change um, or could be changing. But yeah, I think that, so I hope I answered that question. Malaria is a certainly a more immediate concern. Not that pox is not, but we know that honey creepers can get infected with pox and survive for quite a while. So, so I, I guess I have a two-part question. So I guess for like for the for the birds, are are you thinking of doing something similar, for like the, like what they did with the alala, like how they brought in birds and reared them and, and all that stuff. And part two, I guess, is do you know if the conservation conference is still happening? <laughs> um, if, if my happens. audio doesn't go out, I can try and answer the first part of that. We see you, Hannah. Okay, can if, if this is okay, I can try to answer that. So. The, as far as the captive, so we're still working on a plan to see if that law program it, as far as cat birds in captivity, but it may or may not be breeding. It might only be holding until they can be released again. So Hannah, you were uh, your audio is going out there again. I think what you're saying is you're going to be holding QEQ in captivity potentially to be released again, or, or maybe Laura or Chris Warren can jump on and talk about the current captive rearing that's been done. And then Morgan's also pasted in the chat um, for you, Nathan, the link to the conservation conference, which is virtual this year. I mean, all I will add about um, the captive program, I guess, is uh, the main goal behind what we're doing right now is ensuring that some number of QEQ survive the decade. Um, and in order for that to happen, that will probably require some captive breeding. Um, and it basically, it's kind of a, I think most people would agree that captive rearing in this kind of situation is a last ditch effort, that nobody really loves the idea of bringing these birds into captivity. There's lots of issues with an exit strategy. How do you produce birds of high enough release quality that they're gonna be able to do okay in the wild? And that's a lot of the problems that they're having with Allah, although they've had great success. I don't mean to say anything negative there. Um, 
but they, the, the species was extinct in the wild for a while, as you may know. And the birds that they're releasing now are completely naive. Um, and so I don't think we want to be in a situation where we only have captive reared birds. Um, but if that is all the kiwi kiwi we have left, then we'd like to have that option. Um, the rate of decline is, is scary to see. Um, and at least the way I think about it, if we take, if we establish a captive population and the wild population proves to be um, better at sticking around than the projections show, then that's excellent. And we can release the captive birds back into the wild. We could even shut down the captive breeding program if we deem that necessary. Um, if once the mosquito controls are in place, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, it's nobody's first choice. Um, it's, it, but it may be our best choice in keeping them around until we can control mosquitoes on the landscape. Yeah, thank you. And several people added into the chat the comments about the wine conservation con conference this year. And yeah, there's eight of us giving talks on the mosquito work, including one that's talking about mosquitoes and avian malaria on Maui over in Kipahulu but also looking at it statewide. I mean, this episode was focused on QBQ, uh, but similar problems are having, happening over in the Alakai on Kauai and species there are going extinct too, not quite as fast as QBQ, but they have a similar problem with uh, mosquitoes and malaria moving up into the previous refuges of these forest birds. Mahalo. Um, I'm going to open up our, it's our final audience participation poll of the day, uh, and it's, it's a post-reflection, so it's where you score on a scale of one to five, how did you feel before the Zoominar, how do you feel now, and there's a few questions, we'll just leave that running while um, we wrap up our final few minutes here. Um, I think we have one or maybe two other questions. Um, precautions being made to safeguard the remaining QEQ. Um, and so the, this person is saying that they started their conservation career just as we lost the Pouli. Um, yeah, I think Hannah somewhat um, responded to that, that it's really difficult to protect these birds in the wild. Uh, you know, I think Taya in the episode was talking about the landscape, how it's, or maybe it was Hannah, that the landscape out there is just so nuts and um, it's very, very steep. It's super remote. There's, you know, as this person probably knows, there's only helicopter access um, if they work with the Po'o'uli. Um, so it's really difficult to, um, you know, implement tools across the landscape that would help them like predator control um, but that's why we're, we're hoping that the Wabaki is going to work because it is something that we can implement on the landscape scale. So that's what we can do to help them um, in the wild um, as of right now. Um, and then there was another question that I actually unmuted myself to respond to, the volunteer opportunities and donations. Um, there's a bunch of links in the chat if you can go up, but um, MauiForestBirds.org has volunteer opportunities and information about donating. Uh, conservationconnections.org is also a really good website to learn about different conservation organizations across the Hawaiian Islands and ways to get involved.
Okay, well, um, we're coming up on our three o'clock mark. So I'll stay on Zoom for a few minutes in case there are any questions people would like to remain on and ask. And otherwise, um, we'll say a big round of applause to everybody in the episode and, and for all of our hard work together. And mahalo for joining us. Thank you, guys. It's great. Thank you. So, what what day does it air again? Um, September twelfth and thirteenth. September twelfth is a Saturday at four p.m. on K five, and then yeah. September thirteenth at six p.m. on K five. And I'm gonna. Then will it be on YouTube or oh. Vimeo? The following week. Thank you. At that same URL. So here we go. Question? Yes, Carrie. I was wondering if this technique could be, uh, is it considered a GMO technique or could it be confused with a GMO technique, which is probably likely, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, those are great questions. And, and the short answer is it's not GMO. There's no modification of any genes in the mosquitoes. And another, um, another key thing is that it's not self-perpetuating. You have to keep releasing the mosquitoes in order the male mosquitoes with the different uh, Wolbachia strain in order to keep suppressing the population. Um, so if you stop, if we stop releasing them, it would take a while, but eventually the mosquitoes would build back up. And I think for a lot of, for some, I, I won't even get into gene drive because I'm not, I'm not yeah. talking about yeah. that, but, but no, it's not, it is not modifying the genetics of the species. Okay. And that bacteria doesn't linger in the environment then? It pretty much, yeah. Well, the bacteria is carried, it's a naturally occurring bacteria. Um, the ba Wolbachia, as, as um, the section that with Floyd Reed pointed out, it's present in lots of um, arthropods, insects in the environment already. And so it's going to be out there, but, but it's within the species. It's not transmitted, um, like the mosquito doesn't transmit it to a human by biting a human. It has to be transmitted, it's passed on maternally through its reproduction. Okay, thank you. And I, I think that brings up a really good point. You know, we as a conservation community, we talked a lot about um, having good messaging about this because there's, there's the potential to have a lot of confusion about the technique. And, um, you know, I think the key points are we would be releasing only male mosquitoes that do not bite, um, only female mosquitoes bite. And like Taya said, it's, it's not self-perpetuating. Um, so we have, we have high hopes, but we also, we don't think it could have really any negative effects on the human population in any way. And one of the things that I think it's, it's hard, there's so much information relevant to this, this project, but, but, using it for human health, not only human health, but even for a human nuisance factor in Kentucky, they use this technique to, you can order your box of male mosquitoes for the summertime so that you don't have those mosquitoes around you when you're doing your barbecues. <laughs> um, so people mail order mosquitoes. And if it were something that people had serious concerns about from a health perspective or um, or an environmental perspective, I don't think a business like that would survive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. Okay. Thank you, Kenisa. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Morgan, for having us. Thanks, everyone. This is a great session. Yeah, yeah thanks. Mahalo Happy for being here. <laughs>